it changed the entire landscape. And then it got changed again in 2008 when the Americans with Disabilities Act Amendments Act was passed. And let me explain why. Because if you suffer from any condition that interferes with your ability to have equal access in a court of law under Title II, you're entitled to accommodation. And that means they have to alter things for you. They have to alter procedures. They have to alter uh, the time of day. Whatever is a reasonable accommodation. So I made it my work now. My husband died at age 63 from kidney failure that all started with that high blood pressure. And I'm very determined that nobody else is going to go that way with that kind of heartbreak and, uh, and die the way that he did. But I have put together the program so that I'm training advocates, and I want advocates in every courthouse in this nation because we go in and we meet with administration. The judge does not say whether or not you get accommodation. It's the law. It's a mandate. They have to give you accommodation, period. So you go to the administrator, and you sit down with them and say, my client needs uh, uh, his day to start later, needs to stop for medication at 2 p.m., um, needs our presence at all times by their side so that we are continually indexing their materials, handing them what they need, uh, taking a break when they begin to lose uh, um, their concentration. And we see to it that the accommodations are in place they stay in place, and nobody can get in the middle of them. And the law also clearly says the other side cannot harass you, cannot retaliate against you, cannot intimidate you, cannot bother you. Because we, when we walk in that courtroom with our client, half the time the other side, side says, well, this looks like unlicensed practice of law to us, Your Honor. And I say, no, Your Honor, we're under the Americans with Disabilities Act. And we're here to ensure that our client stays functional and has participatory and testimonial access because that's what they've been denied. Under Supreme Court law, Tennessee versus Lane, we got physical access. They had to get your body in that courtroom. They had to have wide bathroom stalls. They had to have a ramp and they had to get away, have a way to get your body in. But your body can be in there all day long and if you're being attacked emotionally, and you have post-traumatic stress disorder or another invisible disability, you don't have access to that court. And that's what you're guaranteed under Title II and Title III. And so that's what our job is. And we work all over the nation. I got people flying everywhere, and we are getting in these courthouses beside these people and putting an end to humiliation, the rumors that are told, the exploitation of these conditions is only fair. We get a fair trial. For Do you find that most people who are suffering from legal abuse syndrome have been more embroiled in criminal or civil court proceedings? Which type of cases tend to cause more stress or trauma? Uh, in civil cases, it's terrible. And in family cases, it's really terrible. Criminal cases... There is a little more structure. Uh, you're told you have uh, an attorney, although it takes a lot of education of the attorney to try and get them working with. We work in both arenas, but mostly civil. And probate court is dreadful, and family court is dreadful. These are just two of the courts that we uh, need to get into more. I have a training program starting March that I hope they'll tell what people have to yeah, sign we'll, up for. We'll, we, we will talk about that. Because we, we got to get people in there. And, yes, that, um, yeah, we'll definitely, uh, it's mostly civil. We'll definitely get to that. Uh, in your experience, are there particular characteristics that will identify people who are more or less likely to be affected to this degree, um, people to succumb to the condition, or maybe social environments that are more conducive to it? Um, any characteristics like that in terms of legal abuse syndrome? Nothing that I can point out that you can put your finger on. I, I, we have studied it neurologically, and we know it can get down to the alleles and, and the length 
of certain of your, your neural fibers. And certainly early experiences, early traumatic experiences where you have been oppressed or abused, that kind of thing, it tends to predispose somewhat. But I'll tell you, the strongest person on God's earth can walk into a court of law. And this wonderful physician from Harvard um, that does a lot of work with post-traumatic stress disorder said if one were to design a system for creating post-traumatic stress, one could not do better than a court of law. Wow. So the environment itself, and it attacks the attorneys, too. By the time I'm done, I've got the attorney stopping me in the hallway saying, I've got those symptoms, too. Oh, really? So they're actually... Absolutely. Wow. Oh, that surprises me completely. Yes. Yes, because it, it's a toxic environment. It has evolved or devolved, if you will, into a toxic environment. It's too expensive. It's commercialized. The games that are played behind the scenes, we're not privy to, but we know they're being played. You can see it happening. You know, I can sit and witness going on. But the beauty of involving the federal court and the fact that Congress gave us the gift of this law is that they no longer can just exploit a disabled person without consequence. You know, because I, you have rights now to trigger federal uh, discrimination uh, suits against them, et cetera. Now, uh, how, uh, does it go so far as the ADA, does it go so far as to recognize legal abuse syndrome itself as a disability? Yes, because I, when I did peer review, I was very careful about this. But I have built, is built with brick and mortar, trust me. Uh, and so it's post-traumatic stress disorder in the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual accepted by the court, uh, the DSM-4, and it's 309.81. But then if you look at what's called the Global Assessment of Functioning, uh, in the uh, first part of the book, you always rate that. And legal is one of the stressors that interfere with your ability to function. So it's... So it, in that book, and it has to be recognized, it's, so, uh, it's um, compensable by insurance, and it has to be recognized the same as any other illness or injury. Which means even if somebody is not, for example, in a wheelchair or something, they have to be accommodated in terms of any special needs they might have because they also have a disability. Isn't that true? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> I love it. I love it. All right, now the big question, if there's an answer, what's the cure? I've uh, worked up an eight-step program that I've tested now for 20 years, and it, it's a pretty standard program for dealing with post-traumatic stress disorder, except my eight steps deal with the fact that you're going to be re-traumatized. You can go to treatment for PTSD and come away feeling better. The minute you have to go back to court, you're back with your symptoms. So my eight steps that I train the advocate to use a supportive counseling model uh, has to do with the fact you know you're going to get it again, and it's going to be again and again and again. And so we have to deal with what happens to a person when they have to go through. That's really cruel and unusual punishment. So we're dealing with people that are going through the worst of torture. It can't get any worse than it, that you feel it's unbearable to you and you have to go back and back and back. And people who lose their children in wrongful custody situations due to lies, people that have lost their property or have a, a person put under a guardianship that you know is not good for an elderly person, these people are frantic. And they live with unbearable court order. And then they have to go back and back and back. And that's the milieu I have to work in. I have to keep that person functional. I have to, and my advocates, we have to toggle from a supportive counseling model back into court and helping them gear up for their case and be sure that they say what they mean to say and be sure that they have everything with them because they'll forget things. Wow, that's uh, that's absolutely amazing. 
Um, where can people go to buy the book? Uh, they go to L-V-A-A-L-L-C dot com. Legal Victim Assistance Advocate. L-L-C dot com. L-V-A-A-L-L-C dot com. Got it. I have that here. And we'll, we'll make sure. Or we can... they can eat. They can email me at legalabuse at gmail.com, too. Okay, and then there is also a website, www.legalabusesyndrome.com. Tell us about that. Well, that really will take you to lvaallc.com. Those are now being pretty well combined. And I've had somebody get in and do kind of a conversion trying to feel into legal abuse syndrome and make it look like something else. It looks like kind of a sabotage going on. So I really advise people to go to the lvaallc.com. All right, and we'll put a link up uh, on our website to that as well. You said you have an upcoming seminar on the ADA advocates. Tell us about that, please. I'm training people uh, to become advocates. Uh, they get paid for what they do. Uh, they are independent contractors, and they can charge depending on their qualifications for uh, however they work with their clients. But I uh, train them. It's a, a comprehensive training. We mean business. We mean for them to be out there working, and we mean for them to make a difference. They can get, if they're in the behavioral sciences or any of the medical sciences, they can get 18 continuing education units. If they're lawyers, they can get a legal education unit, 18. It meets the ethical requirement that all professionals uh, have to take. It goes March 10th through May 19th. It's scattered in there. We do a two-hour online session about once a week, but we skip a few weeks for their holidays. Um, the, the cost is 495 but it is a discount if they sign up before March 5th to 475 and if a group comes out of one office for one area, they get a discount. I will negotiate with groups. Uh, we we get them up and ready. They get a textbook. They get very comprehensive training. And I stick with them for about a year that I consider is a, an internship. And I'm there available to help them every step of the way. And the best way to get in touch if uh, they're interested is through the website? The website is good or legalabuse at gmail.com. They'll get right to me and I'll talk. Excellent. My guest has been Dr. Karen Huffer. She is the author of Overcoming the Devastation of Legal Abuse Syndrome. And I know all of you out there that i got to get this book because you've all experienced it, every one of you. And, uh, Dr. Huffer, I want to thank you so much for uh, enlightening me uh, as well as my listeners to this. Uh, this is fascinating, and I, I applaud you for pursuing it. My pleasure, Brent. Thank you so much, and best wishes to you. Absolutely. Dr. Karen Huffer, and again, let me give you these websites, www.lvaallc.com. We'll have that up on the Global Freedom Report website. You can also go to legalabusesyndrome.com, and legalabuse at gmail will get you to Dr. Huffer.